Hi, this is Regina Y. Favors with Pre-Singles Counseling. This is part of my Pre-Singles Counseling Coaching Curriculum where I design lessons and case studies based in the psychology literature on different topics. This Pre-Singles Counseling is targeted to three types of individuals. The first individual is a single, is a person who is interested in becoming single. That, per, that means that person is not necessarily interested in dating or entering the marriage market. The second individual is a single individual who is interested in entering the dating market. And then the last individual is a single dating individual who is interested in marriage. So take some time to listen to this lesson and our case study. Please leave a comment uh, and I will reply. In addition, uh, please consider subscribing to the channel, hit the notification bell if you are interested in further topics. This is Pre-Singles Counseling, a Pre-Singles Counseling Coaching Curriculum. Thank you for visiting the channel. This lesson is subject to fair use where I will comment, criticize, um, offer research as well as teach and provide scholarship. Single women should be knowledgeable about what it means to be single and how to navigate their singleness regardless of, of a decision to date or marry. This means that single women should take the necessary time to learn about their singleness, set academic, professional, and personal goals, and contemplate whether they are ready to enter the dating market. Single women should never enter the dating market without a goal and a plan. Therefore, one of the most important aspects of being a single woman is that you can plan your transition, establish a time schedule, set mating preferences, and learn about how men and women date. Pre-singles counseling is based in a decision to enter or exit singleness. Pre-singles is the time period between single and contemplation of dating. There is a difference between being a single individual and being a sin single individual who has entered the dating market, which includes the sex market. Pre-singles counseling reflects the processes by which an individual researches, learns, and plans to navigate life either as a single, a dating single, or a single interested in marriage. So pre-singles defined, pre-singles counseling is defined as the research processes and planning for entering a state of singlehood. The main target audience is 18 to 45 years of age, man and woman. However, middle school to high school students are considered. Processes include single to single. So that is that transitional time prior to entering the dating market at any age. Single to dating single that transitional time prior to considering marriage, and then single dating to marriage, that transitional time prior to and after premarital counseling. Pre-singles counseling is the immediate strategy of adopting life plans to manage the self as a responsible individual adult, adult up to and including a major life change. So here are some pre-lecture discussion questions. So are you single? This question means single without separation or dating rotation or on, on again, off again, boyfriend or any other romantic relationship, including rebounding and dating. Why are you single? Are you enduring a recent separation from a romantic partner? Do you plan to remain single? What are your plans to change from single to a member of a romantic couple or marriage? Do you have a financial plan as a single woman? And you will see throughout this lecture, this orientation course, um, that I focus most, if not all of the topics on having a financial plan. We oftentimes make uh, unsound decisions based upon um, 
the fact that we don't have enough money or we are looking for money or we are looking for someone to cover us and we are not covering ourselves financially. So keep that in mind. You will, you will see throughout this orientation multiple references to financial planning. Pre-discussion, so what is your SWAT? So I'm using um, SWAT that you would normally see in business um, as a way to um, get you to engage your own personal SWAT. So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? So after each section, I will ask you what your SWAT is. So, five-year plan, preparing for transition. The five-year plan is necessary at any age, but beyond the two-year plan, this means that you can have a two-year to five-year plan. The five-year plan may involve career planning from supervisor to manager, from manager to director, from any position to upper management. The five-year plan may involve pursuing financial stability beyond the two-year plan. And then the five-year plan may involve investing more money into a retirement and or investment fund. It just depends. It depends on how much you are already paying out in expenses, right? But people don't get to, to upper management just by osmosis. They don't get there hoping and wishing. They plan their way up. Um, they plan their way horizontally and they plan their, their way um, vertically. The five-year plan is necessary as a self-reflection tool. So you can reflect on the past two years to determine gaps in your understanding, gaps in your pay, and gaps in your education. You can reflect on that last three years to determine if your plan is still feasible. You can reflect on the last five years to determine the point at which the plan has been effective. And you can reflect on the last five years to determine your financial cap capacity for moving forward. So you're always in a mode of thinking about that the, uh, you had your two-year plan and then now you have the five-year plan. But the five-year plan is more about self-reflection. You going back and looking at your progress, your process and your progress. And is that plan that you had during those three years between two and five, uh, is that plan feasible going forward after five years, right? What At what point um, is the plan effective? And then at what point the plan may not be effective, you know, considering maybe a job loss. So the plan that you were adopting to save $6,000, right, for example, okay? And you were doing just fine and going very good. And then you, and then the company cut your hours. So that means your financial capacity has lessened in a sense, right? It's hard to move forward with, uh, with the same goals you had with a new financial capacity. So now you're gonna have to think about ways in which you're going to be able to still meet your, save, your emergency savings objective while you are enduring cut to your hours that might affect your shelter costs. So it depends on if you may have to wait out um, your um, investment plan and then seek out a new job, an additional job, or wait to, to the company increase your hours. So that's something that you have to reflect on. Uh, and then of course, if you begin earning more money, then that means your financial capacity has increased. And then you can look at the fact, okay, I have been effective in saving X, X amount of dollars. I really want to get to this 6,000. So now that I'm making more money, I'm going to increase my financial capacity, actually speed it up and begin to increase how much I put into the investment product. The five-year plan determines if you will be able to sustain yourself financially. Given the fact that you have completed education and, and established multiple financial plans, this is the time to review your progress to date. This is also the time to determine where you want to take your mind, heart, and body, uh, your career, and your finances. So that's why it's very important that if you're going to take chances in your career, you need to make sure that you have base finances. 
if you're going to take chances in your life and start a business, you still need to keep the job. I always thought that you needed to quit the job to be devoted to, you know, starting a business, but that's not key. You still need cash flow because if something goes wrong with the, uh, the business, you still can pay your rent. You still can pay your car. You still can pay any of the other expenses to, uh, to keep yourself afloat. The five-year plan, uh, plan is useful for gaining insight into your health needs before you move into a 10-year plan that will require more energy, work ethic, and time. A visit to the doctor to get that five-year checkup is important. Assessing your health and what you can muster by day, week, month is important because the next levels require more energy, time, and capacity. You must know your capacity to operate at multiple levels. You know, think about a person, this may not necessarily apply, but I, I wanna give you a visual. So think about the person who wants to run and become sort of like a professional runner. Uh, not necessarily go to the Olympics, but they run in all these, um, you know, different 5K, 10K races, right? Well, there's a whole sort of body of self-help articles and information and content on the internet about how to run your first race, how to run your second, third, how to meet your running time, things like that, right? If you're just walking somewhere, a lot of times all you need is a good uh, good long stretch and maybe uh, the types um, um, you know the types of food that will sustain that energy is a 5k, right? But if you're going to run a 10K, you are practicing running a 10K every day or, or three times a week or something like that, right? You don't run a 10K the very first day that race comes to town. You have practiced for at least a year or two years just to run that one 10K because it's going to require more energy, more work ethic, more time. You need to visit the doctor. You need to look at your capacity. And, and how you can operate at multiple levels. So if you're running um, a 10K in your hometown, but, but, the op but the obstacle course is not that difficult, right? You can run it, that's fine. But then you may wanna run the Boston Marathon. Okay, that's not something that you can do um, just on the first try. Those people train to do that. They, they live in the gym they use certain types of gym um, um, types of machines. They um, use certain type of protein, food. Um, sometimes they have running partners. It's a whole lifestyle. It's work for them. They have jobs, but they, but they take the time to build up capacity for multiple levels, right? And some of them go internationally. Uh, so it's a whole big, big, big thing. And then we're not even, you know, talking about those big monster triathlon type um, type uh, things, um, you know, type um, activities. We're not even talking about that because that takes even more. You're basically running every day. You are building your body and your capacity and pushing your body to the limits just to run a race race. Uh, a few races a year or something like that. Well, it's no different than anything that you're trying to do. If you're trying to get into a business, you need to know your capacity. Your capacity is going to be measured by your knowledge. Do you know accounting? Do you know tax laws? Do you know contracts? Do you know your industry, the specific tailoring to your client needs in that particular industry? That's why you need to do a health checkup. Because some things, some some things you get into can kill you if you're not ready for it mentally, uh, physically. Uh, you need a heart checkup. You need uh, uh, check your breathing. You know, uh, check your ability to uh, to walk. Right. So knowing your capacity to operate at multiple levels should be something that, that you begin checking at your five year plan. The five-year plan is useful for addressing any anxiety or doubt about who you are as a person, what you want to do, and what you want 
and can accomplish. Successes are intoxicating, but they also reveal anxiety about replicating success at the next level. Just because you accomplish a success does not necessarily translate as your capacity to resolve a single defining problem and achieve a solution that is universally uh, acceptable. There is a difference between success and achievement. So we, we oftentimes measure whatever we're doing now by the, by the successes in the past because we were able to accomplish something. We think that that automatically translates into the new thing that we're doing. But each success has its own woes, has its own challenges, has its own influence, has its own threats. And so you can't treat one success over here like it is going to be a success over over you know somewhere else right that means you got to think about the anxiety that you might feel can you keep this up you know going into the entertainment industry or going into the filmmaking industry becoming an actor actress right that's i think that's a very um mind-wrecking choice because you may do great on one film but can you replicate your ability for the next film? Because if you don't, you're like a one hit wonder, right? And so um, studios and book publishers and any other types of related organizations, they need to be able to make money off of you consistently. That's why you have publishers who ask you, okay, when will you have your next book? And any book that you have needs to be translatable into uh, some film or online web series or or um, anything anything like that it, it has to be it has to be convertible in a sense right um, that we can get not only you know books out of you but we can turn them into an HBO uh, series or a Hulu series or a Netflix original or something like that because they need to be able to get money can you do that that's something you can't look at your one book and say, okay, that's enough. No, if you want to uh, be a screenwriter, if you want to write films, okay, and you get a, a a production company who's interested in your work, they're going to consistently ask you, so how many other scripts have you written? You know, I want I I remember something that Spike Lee said in an interview that some people, these people today. They think that the one script is the only thing they need, but uh, organizations, studios, production companies are looking for more than, you should have more scripts because you need a portfolio. You need a, you need a portfolio. You need something that tells them that you know that this, that you are serious about this. So successes are, are, are intoxicating. Before you even approach the industry, any industry, especially if you want to write or act or something like that, you need to build a body of work. I don't know how long that work needs to be, but it needs to be a body of work. It, like if a person wants to uh, be an artist, they don't just draw one painting. They need a collection because if they, if a museum is ever interested in, in showcasing their work, they're going to need a ready collection or be ready or have something. Like I love that show... Um, it's about the clothes. Um, I forget, but it, it's a sewing competition, and it's uh, by that model lady. I forget her name. That when they are showcasing their work at the end of the season, they're not showcasing two pieces. You learn how to create uh, a piece uh, by, say, like instruction. Here's here's what you're going to. Uh, create for the week but by the end you should have built your capacity to actually showcase a, a whole collection and it has to be very distinct enough but cohesive each piece has to be distinct but the whole collection has to be cohesive and so can, now if you win the competition can you replicate that skill at the next level that's why while no one knows your name, no one knows who you are, that's the time to practice building a collection, right? 
Um, and then, of course, there is a difference between success and uh, achievement. Success is momentary. It is little things that you do, and then you get some kind of mark for it. You get a hand clap. It's a success, right? Achievement is you. It is something that that will take you a long term, long time to accomplish. So you have this single definable problem that you want to accomplish. Say, for instance, you want to uh, resolve the crisis in Syria right the the humanitarian crisis crisis in syria and now it has become crises so it's more than one well that's not something that's going to be resolved in a year not even five years that's going to take 10 15 20 almost our lifetime to resolve your part might be 10 15 20 25 years and then you solve a part of that crisis and that's achievement so success is something that you can accomplish. If you take a course, you endure the course, you complete the course, and you get a grade, that's success. But if if um, uh, if your field requires you to take multiple degrees, like becoming a doctor, um, that may have a form of achievement in it. Uh, but once you get into your specialty, the achievement is a problem that you solve. Uh, that takes a long time to solve. The five-year plan must include research before transitioning to the next level. This requires assessing where you are in your career, researching where you want to go with your career, and planning the process based on the expectations of the career slash industry. This requires assessing where you are in your finances, researching where you want to go with your finances and planning the process based on the expectations of your financial capacity. This requires assessing where you are in your education, researching where you want to go with your education, and planning the process based on the expectations of your career plan. So they're all sort of intermingled. And financial, cap, um, financial capacity is the thing that sort of links everything. It's hard to make the moves that you want to make if you don't have the financial capacity. It's hard to increase your knowledge by maybe getting another degree if you don't have the financial capacity. It may be hard to move up the career ladder if you're not paid more, which might not increase your financial capacity. But the five-year part of your, your planning and your self-assessing will help you to be able to gauge where you are. The five-year plan must include journaling your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. At five years, what is your current strength? How have you, you developed your strength? What is your weakness? How have you resolved your weaknesses? What is your opportunity? How have you used your opportunities? And then what is your threat? How have you hedged against threats? So you should have collected strengths by five years. There should be like a major strength that you continue to hone and develop, but then um, uh, you begin to increase your capacity in terms of strengths, right? Uh, it depends, you know, if you are, uh, say for instance, you want to major in math and you become a tutor, okay? Well, your, one of your strengths is that you know how to, write out the math problem just you know like the snap of a finger but as you increase your capacity by taking courses right um you realize you pick up another strength and the next strength is you being able to teach math to somebody not necessarily as an official teacher but you become a tutor or something like in a math lab and you have to deal with you know different students who uh, need help with understanding math. And so now you are picking up an additional strength to teach math to somebody. So now you have a collection of strengths, right? And so just begin to continue to assess that. Your weakness, so you realize there, your weakness might have been uh, at planning. You're not good at scheduling or you don't go, you don't get somewhere on time, right? So then you talk to a counselor about it. You got some help, you read some books. And you, you began to tackle 
one weakness at a time. And so you resolved one of your weaknesses about not getting to places on time by leaving early enough so that you can be there on time, right? Versus you getting to the car and the interview is at one o'clock and you arrived in the parking lot at one o'clock. Then your opportunity, you realize that, that the people around you may be opportunities from you for you to glean from, right? Um, you have a sister or a friend who tends to be better at the thing that you are struggling with, or you had a professor that you asked a question and he sort of uh, gave you a good understanding about it. So you use that as an opportunity to increase your understanding, right? Uh, so opportunities, it just, opportunities is really all about learning and adding to your knowledge base. That's what I feel that there's always an opportunity to learn, to uh, learn uh, in order to increase, in order to resolve any sort of issues that I have. Then your threat, again, is always you. So if you feel like you don't need to assess your strength or your weaknesses or your opportunities, then that's a threat because eventually you're going to have to do that as you move up the next levels. So let's look at each of the, um, um, let's look at the acronym. So um, five-year plan strength. The five-year plan must include journaling your strengths. So assessment of strengths might include reviewing and critically thinking about how well you do something. For example, if you are great at writing and you want to do something with your writing, then you should have a portfolio of writing. You never wait until you make it to begin writing. You should always write until your transition comes. A strength might be how well you communicate, plan, continue to develop that skill. Weakness, so the five-year plan must include journaling your weaknesses. So assessment of weaknesses might include reviewing and critically thinking about your struggles. For example, where are you overextended financially? Being overextended Financially will affect other areas in your life, both professionally and personally. Develop a plan to address overextension. And this is where we are usually over overextended in finances. And it's, it likely is because you are giving your money to somebody who really doesn't need it, who, keep, who, uh, who keeps saying he or she needs the money, but they won't go and, um, and get a job or something like that. So that might actually be a struggle for you. The five-year plan must include journaling your opportunities. So uh, assessment of opportunities might include reviewing your options. For example, what are your career or education or small business options? Understanding your options and the timeline with which to consider and implement them will affect all areas in your life, both professionally and personally. Develop a plan to address opportunities specifically when they are good or, or untimely. So um, one of those opportunities, a lot of times, comes at you when you have a friend who says, okay, let's go over here and let's go visit this organization because they're giving a free class. It may be uh, a schedule that, uh, that is not working with your current schedule and it may be inconvenient, but it's also free. Now, you don't, know, you don't always need to go to everything that is free because it can, it might be a time waster but if it's something connected to something that you're doing and you're struggling, say for instance, you want, you're struggling with character development in your novel, right? And the class just so happens to be a class on how to build better character in your novel. Okay, that's the class to go to. They may have free resources. They, uh, you get to talk to somebody there, gain some insight. That is an opportunity. Uh, so you have to weigh every opportunity to determine if it is a true opportunity or if it's just an option. You may be able to get that same opportunity on your college campus, at your job, or just by simply uh, researching on the internet as well. Threats. So the five-year plan must include journaling your threats. Assessment of threats might include com contemplating your internal beliefs. For example, you are always your own worst enemy vacillating between decisions, attitudes, and beliefs will always affect every area of your life, both professionally and personally. Develop a plan to address your own beliefs about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. 
And, you know, that last one is very interesting because happiness means different things to different people. Happiness for some people might be sound finances, that I feel happy when I have money. I don't have to have a million dollars, but I but I do need to have some kind of money. I don't want to I, I don't want to be broke. Right? Uh but some people don't care too much. Some people actually want a lot of money. They want a million dollars because it gives them the type of freedom that they don't necessarily have to work on a job, but they can work when they want to work, right? Life and love, it depends, you know, what what does love mean to you? What does love mean to the other person? Have the conversation. I've always said in all of my audios that we don't have conversation anymore. We just jump to the sex. And then your beliefs about life, what are your core values? What's your, what's your own personal mission statement? Um, that's important. Knowledge check. So five-year plan, considering your academic, professional, and personal goals, especially in pursuit of financial stability, answer the following. What are your five-year planning strengths? What are your five-year planning weaknesses? What are your five-year planning opportunities? What are your five-year planning threats? So um, the most important thing about your five-year plan, um, I, I think it always has something to do with academic and professional, what you want to do with yourself in terms of your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But I kind of want to think about your personal goals because what you do in your personal life affects your academic and professional. So where are you, if you're struggling and you are overextended financially, uh, what are your strengths there first? Meaning in order for somebody to come and ask you, in order for you to be overextended financially, that means you must have the finances. So people keep asking you because they know they can rely on you. So then the strengths will be that you always have money, right? That, that you have learned by five years now to make sure to have money. The weakness might be still the overextension and that the weakness might also be you run your mouth. You tell all your business. Why is it that everyone is coming to you for money? Why can't they go and just go get a job and handle the situation themselves? So you're teaching people how to use you, for one. You're teaching people how to be dependent, for two. You're uh, teaching people how to basically use you as a mule. So uh, use you to fund their lifestyle, right? So uh, that overextension has a, has a lot of implications. The opportunity could be to challenge the person with the goal of them not coming to you with money. So... One of the opportunities could be, and I had to learn this myself because I was overextended. I always need, I always ran my mouth. I always volunteered my money. So then I prayed about it because I was tired. And God gave me this sort of um, uh, answer to the, to the problem. Uh, tell the person who's asking you for that money that this is um, a bill money. You know, it can be a bill money or something like that and that you're going to need it back when the bill comes. And if you if you give them sort of like a target, if you give them a, a guideline, a deadline, or a responsibility to return it, they might think twice about asking you for it. If they play games and say they don't have it, but they come over your house with some new sneakers, and a new hairstyle, that's telling. That's more than enough to tell you, okay, I'm going to have to cut back on what I do for this person because they're not taking it seriously and they're asking me for something that they don't really need, right? So the opportunity is always to, uh, is, is one of those teachable moments, you know, that our parents usually do with us, a teachable moment, create a teachable moment. Maybe make it a lesson so... Um, for instance, uh, um, you you need $150 from me, and you could say, well, you're going to have to pay it back in increments 
of, I don't know, two increments or three incre increments or five, right? I'm going to put you on a payment plan. And then we're going to talk about also, you know, finances. So here's a, here's like a little handout or something like that. But there's you engaging. Uh, it might sound kind of weird to the person and you might think it might be a little useless. But if you do that, you might end up creating something that could turn into a book, that could turn into an online learning school or something like that. So there's opportunity to learn and teach as well. And then the threat in terms of you being overextended financially, eventually you're not going to have what you need to take care of yourself if you continue to cover other people. One of these days, you're going to give over your rent not knowing that you're giving over your rent or you could give over your rent and lose your job the same day you gave over your rent, you know? So again, you are always your own threat. So conclusions, beliefs about mistakes. So I don't have a full conclusion. I just, I just thought that this right here, this quote from the film Unfaithful was very important. When I put this uh, presentation together, I thought about it. Uh, the movie had just come on HBO, so it was very fresh in my mind. Uh, but this is the, the conversation that Paul Vartan is having with Connie Sumner and Unfaithful. Uh, Richard Gere was her husband. And um, she was talking about mistakes or something like that. And Paul Vartan made a very interesting statement that I did not catch all the times I have watched this film. I did not catch it until now. And it could be because it was for me to catch it now. There is no such thing as a mistake. There is what you do and what you don't do. And it is as simple as that. It is black and white. It is not uh, issues of gray that there is the thing that you do and then there's a thing that you don't do. And so if Connie did not want to um, have an affair, then she didn't have to do it. There was nothing that forced her to have an affair. She forced herself. She, she sought it out. Uh, she visualized it. She sought it out. She made the call. She visited him multiple times and she had an affair, period. She had already had had an affair in her heart uh, emotionally even before she got there. But it, there is no such thing as a mistake. There is what you do and what you don't do. And that's what I want to leave you with, that even if we're, we're not talking about affairs in this pre-singles counseling coaching uh, curriculum orientation, that uh, if you find yourself getting into the dating market and the sex market and then you get pregnant or something like that and you just you didn't intend for that you say that out loud i didn't intend for that i wasn't planning for that well you actually were planning for that because if you didn't use any protection right uh, you were planning for it. but this is something if you date with with purpose if you date with a goal um uh, as a single individual, this will, will help you to hedge against that particular issue. If you don't want to have uh, sex that to lead with a baby, then you need to push for the partner to use contraception, or you need to push for yourself to use contraception, uh, or perform a number of, of strategies, like the pullout game, I don't know. But um, this is you living a single life with purpose, with a plan, with a goal, so that things like this just don't pop up. And and you say, oh, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, I should have done better, okay. Because you, because you can't say that all the time. Once the child is here, that's, that's the rest of your life. Once you get with the wrong partner who might introduce you to drugs, that is an addiction that's gonna take some time to get over and resolve. Once you get involved with somebody that you finally uh, uh, and you know fall in love and find out that he's married, that's hard to get out of. It, you can get out of it, but it's hard to get out of. So that's why it's important to uh, think about being single, understand, date with a person, establish objectives. Because if you don't, you're going to find that 
what you do in your personal life is going to affect your uh, your academic and professional lives, especially your professional. You don't want Paul Bartan to come visit you at your job because you waited too long to cut it off, right? So I'm going to leave you with this as you think about your singleness and whether you want to stand, uh, stay single, single to single, whether you want to begin dating, single uh, to dating single, or whether you are interested in marriage, single dating or dating single to um, single, um, single leading to marriage, right? So that's something that I want you to think about. And I thank you very much for listening to this lecture. All right, so hopefully you were able to gain insight from this video discussion. Please like, subscribe, and visit. So uh, please like the video, hit hit the notification bell for more discussions. I am re-uploading all of my audios, uh, so I, I needed to make some changes to them. Uh, you can visit my, web, my website for more content at reginawhyfavors.com. If you want to send me an email, you can send an email Regina Y Favors at yahoo.com. Please also purchase the book. It's going to come out in spring 2021. So I had to make changes um, to my book to update it. And I also updated, updated the title. So the original title was Bait, Hook, and Switch, Confessions of a Rebound Girl. And I have updated the title to Toxic Encounters, Why People Pursue Rebound Relationships. So right now I'm still basically editing it and I want to make it available in spring 2021. So thank you very much for visiting my channel and I am Regina Y. Favors. Have a great day.